Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Moore, Project Manager for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. I'm eager to introduce Dr. Jimmy Ruiz as our expert presenter, the 13th webinar of the series hosted by the Institute for Clinical Immunology, ICLEO. As you may know, ICLEO is an institute for ACCC and is the only initiative to prepare multidisciplinary cancer care providers for the complex implementation of immunology in a community setting. The ICLEO program provides a host of educational resources and tools such as webinars, newsletters, e-learning modules, tumor subcommittee updates, and an immersed IO visiting expert program and live meetings. Now for today's e-course, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Ruiz, an assistant professor of hematology and oncology at the Wake Forest School of Medicine with clinical and research activity in the medical thoracic oncology program at the Wake Forest Baptist Com Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Veterans Administration VA Medical Center in Salisbury, North Carolina. He is an academic physician that specializes in the treatment of patients with lung cancer. He is, is a principal investigator in a number of phase one through three clinical trials that include NCI cooperative group, industry investigator initiative studies. As he serves as local PI for the number of upfront and second line immunothera immunotherapy studies in NCL in NSCLC. Now for a few housekeeping notes, please feel free to submit questions to our presenter by typing your questions in the box on your dashboard. I will post questions to Dr. Ruiz at the conclusion of this presentation. The webinar will be archived and available on the iCLEO website, ACCC-ICLEO.org. Now I'll send it over to Dr. Ruiz to kick off the webinar. Fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, thank you for attending uh, today's iCLEO webinar. Uh, thank you for the uh, organizers and ICLEO. Uh, this is an important topic to me, uh, certainly near and dear to what I do every day, and I hope to shed some light on uh, kind of a paradigm shift in the way we look at non-small cell lung cancer and institute the use of immunotherapy. Next slide. So the objectives today are, are really to provide some background on um, kind of biology, of uh, the basic biology which involves the immune processes and how immune checkpoints work. So it's, it's important to understand um, what we're talking about when we talk about the utilization of uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, uh, not only for non-small cell lung cancer, but for any, for any cancer that uses immunotherapy, uh, but also uh, how, the, uh, how we've integrated PD-L1 testing uh, in terms of uh, the treatment of these patients. Uh, I'll briefly discuss all the uh, some potentially useful biomarkers uh, that are uh, current and in development for the checkpoint inhibitors, and briefly uh, touch on PDL1 liquid biopsy, all while uh, bringing in the patient in, in, into this conversation, since this is uh, the main reason uh, we do uh, what we do every day. Next slide. So. Uh, Immunotherapy has really changed the way we take care of lung cancer patients, and it certainly uh, has uh, changed the paradigm uh, in terms of treatment and side effects. Uh, here are two uh, cover features in science and nature, noting how cancer immunotherapy has led to several breakthroughs uh, for various different type of cancer, uh, uh, cancers, and that because of it, lives are being changed. Next. So the immune system, I'm going to take you back to, I don't know if you, if you had any of this in undergrad or in medical school, but certainly the immune system process, which I described here in cartoon figure, uh, is, is a bit simplistic, but nonetheless important to understand when we think about these agents. So uh, what we have is, is tumor, and um, uh, tumor sheds tumor antigens. So um, this is uh, seen in the blood or near the tumor. It is then that... Uh, the antigen presenting cells or the dendritic cells come in um, and, and uh, these cells uh, uh, uptake uh, the, these antigens and this leads to a change in the dendritic cell. So uh, uh, the next step is that it, it then uh, expresses uh, MHC with the tumor antigen but also uh, uh, you have an up, 
uh, ticking expression of B7, a key protein, and I'll, and I'll tell you why here in a second. So this cell then goes into a lymph node, and when it, when in the lymph node, it interacts with resting T cells. So the resting T cells seen here uh, will interact with the lymph node. Um, and uh, if we go to the next picture, uh, it, you'll see here the interaction between these two important uh, proteins, B7 interacting with CD, CD28, and the T cell receptor on the T cell interacting with the MHC uh, antigen co uh, complex. This leads to the activation of this T cell, which then has memory, will go after tumor, bacteria, virus, whatnot, and, and subsequently leads to the T cell expansion um, and, and the development of uh, cytokines and perforants and grandsons, which, which kill the, the invader. Um, next slide. So how, do, how does it work with immune checkpoints? Very similarly. So what we have here, um, just to, to, to review the different proteins, you have PDL1, in this case on the tumor cell, you have PD1 uh, interacting with PDL1. And, and this combination uh, leads to, in, to an inactivated T cell. There's senescence. These some cells sometimes become uh, apoptotic. They, they, are, they die off. But the big point here, and I often tell my medical students, is this mechanism basically tells your immune system that is that is looking for these foreign uh, um, uh, tumors or bacteria or whatnot uh, to to look away. That there's nothing here to see. So when when immune checkpoints were introduced, um, the the thought was let's try to figure out a way to upregulate our immune system, activate a sleepy army to attack tumor cells. So uh, if we go to the next cartoon, um, here you have a, a T cell that is inactivated and it binds to um, the complex, the antigen MH MHC complex, and there you see PD-1 and you see the ligand. Now, if you, see, you go to the corner, you see that we have uh, anti-PD-1 um, already in clinical practice. Uh, these inhibitors are nivolumab and pembrolizumab. We also have anti-PDL1. Uh, FDA approved uh, atezolizumab, and then uh, some up and coming drugs seen here. So there is, um, if you look at the, the, the picture, you have anti PD1 binding to the uh, uh, PD1 or an anti PDL1 binding to the PDL1 um, ligand, and, and hence uh, you, don't, you don't get this co inhibitor signal, uh, and this leads to T cell activation. And subsequently, um, uh, porphyrin granzymes, cytokines are being released, and then you get T cell expansion um, thereafter. Next slide. Okay, so what about immunotherapy in non small cell lung cancer? Um, we, we started off with um, second line therapy in non small cell lung cancer because the reality is this is where we first started introducing these drugs. And, and it was in the context of PDL1 testing um, with the possibility of having a biomarker to help us select who would respond. So in this study, Checkmate 017, this was the first uh, randomized study, um, and we call this the squamous cell trial. Uh, this specifically looked at squamous cell uh, carcinoma with the primary endpoint being overall survival. Um, you had uh, uh, randomization to nivolumab versus docetaxel, and you looked for uh, pr uh, progressive disease, and then they came off study. Um, so next slide. So here, here are the Kaplan-Meier curves that, uh, that show an improvement in median overall survival from uh, 9.2 to uh, versus 6.0. Um, you have uh, overall survival advantage at 12 months. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, next, you see, um, next, you also see the tails of the curve. And, and a lot of people make a big deal out of the tails of the curve. And it's because these patients are living much longer than expected. Uh, we hadn't seen this in a long time in non small cell lung cancer, certainly in a second line setting where we got patients living up to two years out. Um, so th this uh, had a huge impre impression on us. Um, if you have a closer inspection of the study outcomes, 
um, in the tail of the curve, uh, you see that the ones that benefited uh, or had this durable uh, response were those that had pd one positive uh, 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 expression on their tumor cells. Uh, but nonetheless, pd one positivity at any cutoff was not statistically prog uh, prognostic nor predictive of benefit. So basically, this study had all comers to, uh, who would benefit despite um, uh, PDL1 expression. Next slide. So Checkmate 057 uh, is a similar study. The exception and uh, differences is this was in a non-squamous cell uh, lung cancer population. So this were uh, patients who um, uh, had one prior platinum doublet were randomized like previous study to nivolumab versus dosotaxel. The primary endpoint here was overall survival. Uh, and here, I think the important point is that pd one expression me uh, was measured using an automated IHC assay, uh, assay, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Next slide. The, here's the Kaplan-Meier curves that show, again, uh, an improvement in median overall survival, 12 months versus 9.4 months. Um, the there was uh, no improvement in median PFS, but patients who showed response to treatment were more likely to have a durable response with nivolumab than docetaxel. So um, because of this, um, you know, there's, there's some patients in which uh, uh, there's a longer period of time to activate the immune system, and there's, and there's slow gradual benefit over time. Uh, and then here's where we start talking about pseudoprogression. But in general, these patients uh, st uh, still did well even if they were not expressors. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so really summarizing PDL1 and the use of nivolumab in the second line setting, we have the two studies, Checkmate 017, which was a squam study, which again, PDL1 positivity at, at any cutoff was not significantly prognostic nor predictive. In Checkmate 057, PDL1 positivity at greater than or equal to 5% strongly correlated with the objective response um, and predicted for an overall survival benefit compared with those attacks. So, however, um, there was still a significant proportion of PDL1 negative patients that benefited from treatment. Hence, the FDA did not specify the use of PDL1 testing or, th or any threshold and did not require testing to use this drug in the second line setting. Next slide. So, what about the other uh, uh, P uh, PD1 inhibitor, Pembrolizumab, uh, in Keynote 01? Um, here, again, comparing it to, uh, at that time, uh, docetaxel, the standard of care. Uh, and and these, these results were announced in mid-December of 2015, showing that uh, pembrolizumab significantly improved overall survival compared with docetaxel in patients with any level of pdl one expression as defined by a tumor proportion score of 1% or more. So indicating um, not only uh, its use in, in what was originally thought the high responders were greater than 50%, but also uh, an expanded role for patients who had any expression. Uh, next slide. Here's the Kaplan-Meier curve that focus on uh, a population of pd one with a total uh, uh, or a tumor proportion score of greater than 50%, again, showing a, a significant um, uh, survival benefit. Next slide. And this was measured in uh, 14 versus 8.2 months. Here you can see this is, uh, um, this is where we stratified PDL1 positivity in this study. Um, uh, if you can do next, you should see a box uh, I want you to see right there. So PDL1 tumor proportion score. You can see that the, the higher score of greater than 50% uh, seemed to have a better response than those were one to 49%, but yet it still favored the use of uh, pembrolizumab versus docetaxel. So when you look at these subsets, uh, there's still uh, uh, it's still very much reasonable to initiate uh, pembrolizumab in this subset of patients with any expression. Next slide. So let me summarize that one up. So so we had Keynote 001, 
um, that showed a PDL1 proportion score greater than 50, I had uh, PFS and OS that were considerably much longer. Um, the duration of response was, however, no different between uh, all the groups uh, here, less than 1% or 1 to 49%. But Keynote 01 uh, showed us that higher proportion scores were more likely to have an objective response. Um, but responses were still observed in 10% of those with a PS of 1 to 49%. So in this second line study, or in the, in, uh, the tumor expression uh, or uh, greater than 1% is what uh, led to FDA to, uh, uh, to use this drug with use of a uh, companion study assay, which we will talk about in a second. Next slide. This is just a good visual to give you an idea of how PDL1 uh, PD scores um, affect overall response rates in patients receiving treatment uh, for non-small cell lung cancer. And this is, again, the second line setting, bringing together data from Keynote 001 and Keynote 010. Um, uh, so uh, clearly, if you're 75 to 100%, uh, your response rates are 45%. Uh, it's interesting if you get closer to 100, they're, they're uh, up to 50% response rates, which is unheard of in lung cancer treatment in general. So here's where the paradigm shift comes. Uh, but you can also see that as you know, 50 to 74%, not bad, about 30%, uh, 25 to 49%, about 20%, which is not too far off from standard chemotherapy. So uh, this is important to note. Uh, next slide. So this, this was an interesting case I wanted to show you to kind of speak to the fact uh, of, of, of the, the tumor proportion score and, and, and how it relates with response. Um, this patient uh, was 54 years old when he presented, and he, and he came to medical attention with a small bowel perforation. Um, this was secondary to a mass in the central abdomen. Uh, he had uh, other mesenteric masses. Uh, he underwent surgical repair of the bowel perforation, and during that process, uh, was able to get a diagnosis. Uh, he, he, the diagnosis was for a metastatic adenocarcinoma of the lung, and this was uh, done pr uh, primarily by immunohistochemistry chemistry testing. Um, so a CT scan of the chest was done, and this revealed the primary cancer type. Next slide. And and this is this is this was the primary lung tumor here. Now, uh, in all fairness, he had additional disease. Um, there were, this is just one snapshot. This was a big mass. Um, there was also a, a right lower uh, pulmonary primary that was big, multiple large mesenteral lymph nodes, subcarinal right hilar, right paratracheal, had a malignant effusion. Uh, he had metastatic involvement of multiple nodal regions, including the adrenal metastases and small bowel mesentery. Uh, next slide kind of get appreciation. This is what was growing in his abdomen, which was surgically resected. But again, there was a lot of disease left over um, in the abdomen. Next slide. So the patient um, recovered from surgery, and he was initiated on um, your standard therapy uh, at the time, which was in early 2016, which was a, a platinum doublet. He received carboplatinum and pemetrexid for two cycles, which he did really bad on. Um, the first course was complicated with pneumonia, required admission, and then the second cycle uh, uh, led to intractable nausea and vomiting, uh, and uh, we were able to keep him out of the hospital. And his follow-up CT scan showed progression after just those two cycles of standard uh, platinum doublet chemotherapy. Um, now, in all fairness, the patient wasn't treated by me uh, at that point, but he came to me for uh, a second opinion. Uh, and when he came to me, um, it, we one he, he he was pretty beat up. Um, he, he wasn't the great candidate for, to be honest with you, for probably any any other therapy uh, besides immunotherapy. Um, having had experience with kind of the, uh, the decreased side effect profile versus chemotherapy. So um, per, per FDA approval, we use nivolumab uh, every two weeks, uh, which was initiated in April 2016. Now, interestingly, in these patients, we were getting um, testing 
uh, for uh, nivolumab. We used it as, uh, not only for research purposes, but we did it also um, to try to make uh, informed decisions moving forward. So I asked the uh, the outside institution to send for PDL1 testing, which they did. Next slide. And uh, interesting, they sent they you know at the time when I looked at it, it, I said, wow, we sent the wrong one because this is the PDL testing for pembrolizumab, and this is what it looks like. So. Uh, this is a send out test apparently to them and, and the description is PDL1 lung. Pembrolizumab um, is noted clearly and if you read into the text, it's the IHC22C3 uh, test, which is FDA approved for the use of pembrolizumab. But the, the, the important point here was that the tumor proportion score was 100% and they circle it here as positive. So 100%. Uh, in this case, I had already started in therapy. This made me feel a lot better than we were on, on track. Next slide. And, and we had a response. And we had a pretty good response after two months of therapy, which uh, substantial shrinkage of the uh, primary lung tumor, but also all the disease in the abdomen uh, disappeared. He had several different metastatic uh, deposits uh, in the abdomen that all uh, basically were undetectable by uh, radiographic imaging. Next slide. So that patient went on and did really well. Uh, he continues on Im immunotherapy now, uh, getting close to one year of therapy. Um, so uh, th this certainly uh, led to a lot of excitement uh, for, for, uh, for us when we were doing the clinical trials. We are seeing responses uh, uh, not unlike this one, uh, which, which as, as you can tell, led to uh, in, uh, in the interest in not only PDL1 or excuse me PD1 inhibitors, but also a potential target in PDL1 um, uh, as, a, as a target. So this is the the first. Um, well, it's the third drug in immunotherapy for lung cancer space, uh, but it, it's the uh, first um, drug uh, that looks specifically as an inhibitor for PDL1. Uh, this was published, um, I'm trying to think, not that long ago, I want to say uh, uh, late last year, I think November, uh, they had 287 patients with non-small cell lung cancer, uh, randomized again to standard of care docetaxel, and you, you're seeing very similar uh, responses. Overall survival, 12.6 versus 9.7 months. Median duration responses were really good, 14.3 versus 7, almost doubling that. Uh, interestingly, in this study, the uh, tezolizumab was uh, stratified by PDL1 expression using their own companion IHD assay, which is the Ventana SP142. Um, and I'll go into more details about these assays. But the big point I want to make here is that this study was, a, uh, this assay is a little different because it took into account both tumor cells and tumor associated immune cells um, for the staining. Uh, and there were four different grades of staining. Um, but in short, treatment with the tezolizumab favored in all but the least PDL1 positive uh, tumors. Next slide. So in summary, regardless of the PDL1 expression levels, uh, PDL1 expression of less than 1% still equaled an improvement in overall survival versus docetaxel. So it is important to note that overall survival was 59% greater among patients in the highest tertile of PDL1 expression, but overall, there was no uh, uh, those with no expression still had a significant 25% improvement over overall survival. Hence, the FDA uh, allowed approval for use of this drug without the use of the uh, assay. Next slide. So, this slide is really to show you the complexity of of these tests, and, I, and I'm going to try to simplify it for you. Um, right now, we have three FDA-approved drugs, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and atezolizumab in the second-line setting for non-small cell lung cancer. Now, in the second-line setting, the one in red is the only true companion diagnostic, meaning you have to have it if you want to use the drug. The definition of a positive test in the second-line setting is any uh, expression basically greater than or equal to 1% expression of tumor cells or immune cells uh, that are not uh, intercalating or at the tumor interface. So this is basically um, a positive result and it's using the companion antibody clone 22C3. Now for nivolumab, which uses the companion antibody 28A, 
or atezolizumab, SP142. These are truly complementary. Um, you use them uh, if you want to, but you don't have to have them. Now, they also have their own definitions of what a positive test is. But in general, these can be used um, without running the assay. Next slide. So the reason we're having a conversation today and the reason we're talking about reflexive testing is because of the implications of first-line therapy non -small cell, of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I just shared with you kind of the background in the second-line setting, uh, which only really mandated testing for the use of pembrolizumab. But go ahead, next slide. But now in the first-line setting, this is a seminal paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, at the end of 2016, looking at pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy for pdl one positive non-small cell lung cancer. This was a big study, uh, a, a large phase two, uh, looking at 305 patients, untreated advanced non-small cell lung cancer, where they looked at pdl one expression on at least 50% of tumor cells. So really enriching a, a, a responsive group um, they either received Pembro or the investigator's choice of a platinum doublet chemotherapy. And there, there was crossover allowed for the study. Next slide. Here's the Kaplan Meyer curve, which shows PDL1 tumor expression of greater than 50%, uh, favoring uh, the pembrolizumab arm versus chemotherapy in the frontline setting. And this is really impressive. So, median progression free survival was 10.3 versus six months. You look at the response rate, uh, 40, uh, close to 45%, um, and, and then the median duration of response was still not even reached at the time of this publication versus 6.3 months for chemotherapy. So in the frontline setting, these were very, uh, very impressive, very similar to your second line therapies. So now we have a drug that we can use in the frontline setting, which, which, uh, which basically mandates us to, to look at PDL1 tumor cell expression because it's only the population that has greater than 50 percent so we can uh, move forward and, and treat with um, with the uh, with pembrolizumab in the frontline setting. Next slide. So again, when the question then becomes, all right, how do we think about testing for PDL1 in non-small cell lung cancer? When? Well, we do it prior to the initiation of first-line therapy. Hence what we deem as reflexive testing, just like we would do reflexive testing in EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, these, uh, these mutations that are actionable. Now we have something else, in this case, IHC for PDL1, which is actionable. Uh, next. So frontline approval of Pembro requires that we test at diagnosis. So what should we test is another issue. Um, usually I answer by cheating, I say accessible tissue. Um, I know that isn't what people want to hear, but it's still very much controversial in terms of what's good tissue and what's bad tissue. Um, and, and, and there's a, like any spectrum, there's a, any, anywhere in between where the answer may lie. So, you know, we have archival tissue, we have fresh tissue um, often, um, and we got mixed responses, so in Keynote 001, they indicated a cover tissue over six months led to unreliable testing. There was concern over a deterioration of the PDL1 protein, and they said fresh tumor biopsies were required. So Kino 010, it confirmed that our cover tissue could be used. So, um, so this is still up for debate. Um, in my practice, I usually like to get the freshest sample I can get if available. Um, uh, and certainly for, for those specimens that are old, um, I will ask for a rebiopsy. So, um, how often to test? That's also unclear, and I'll go into some detail about some of the limitations of PDL1 testing. Um, but uh, in terms of testing, I think it, it really comes down uh, on a case by case uh, basis in terms of the patient and whether they can get a new biopsy or not. Next slide. So, how about where to test? Um, and, and I think. Um, most of the time, we were testing the primary tumor sample through CT-guided biopsies, uh, but also there's a, a, a big push to really look at the metastases. Um, and, and does it make a difference? 
Uh, there have been case series that suggest that a reasonable concordance between both synchronous, meaning the same time but different location, and also metachronous, meaning different times um, where specimens are collected. And basically it says that concordance is anywhere from 75 to 90 percent. So I, I think you can't be wrong with going back to some archival tissue, uh, whether it's a primary or whether it's, it's, it's a, a MET to test. Now, uh, pd one expression, it's important to note this, that it is affected by concurrent or prior treatments. That's important to note. Um, this includes radiation or chemotherapy, um, which may have uh, been administered after a biopsy was obtained. Uh, so that's another thing to think about. Next slide. And I think I couldn't have been taught that lesson um, any more clear than this case. So this case X this is a 59-year-old female who, uh, who had presented with upper right uh, infections for multiple occasions, uh, finally got a chest x-ray which showed an abnormality, and then subsequently a CT scan that showed a nodular density in the left upper lobe. She underwent, she underwent a PET CT which didn't show any other disease. Um, and she had uh, a biopsy of this that showed a non-small cell lung cancer, subsequently went and had a left upper lobectomy, uh, which uh, removed a 4.5 centimeter tumor, uh, basically early stage one cancer uh, for a kind of rare variant of non-small cell lung carcinoma, a giant cell. Uh, well, I, let me back up, not a giant cell. It had giant cell features basically showing to an aggressive tumor type. Um, the tumor was negative for ALK, EGFR, and ROS1 mutation. And PDL1, which is done in our institution reflexively, uh, was negative. So next slide. So three months later, the patient was evaluated um, uh, for progressive neck pain. Um, she had an MRI done from, from my clinic, which showed foraminal stenosis, no evidence of uh, cancer. Um, she subsequently failed conservative treatment, and she went to the OR electively. Um, to have this uh, fixed. Uh, and intraoperably, unfortunately, uh, there was a, a soft tissue uh, mass in the facet that led to a pathological fracture. Um, and the diagnosis came back as consistent with similar primary non small cell lung cancer with giant cell features. Next slide. So this was, uh, she ended up getting a PET scan shortly thereafter, and the only sites of disease were there in the, uh, the cervical neck uh, vertebrae, but also had some uh, in the upper th uh, thoracic um, uh, uh, vertebrae as well. Next slide. Now, when we decided, um, actually, after talking with her, she was a she's a physician, we talked to her, and. And we said, well, it's probably, uh, you know, she, I told her about the study, the case series so on concordance. And we said, let's just go ahead and test it. We have it available to us. And surprisingly, um, the, the tumor proportion score in this case uh, for Pembrolizumab was 50 to 60%. So, um, again, um, the primary, which was only done less than, I want to say, three months ago, um, was PDL1 negative. Uh, at this metastatic site, the PDL1 was positive. Uh, so, uh, fortunately for her, she went on to receive immunotherapy up front and is doing well. Um, happy to say. Next slide. So, you know, th this has been accepted by a lot of uh, oncology societies and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, have, uh, who published their guidelines, uh, uh, clearly note this not only for. Uh, patients with uh, adenocarcinoma or large cell carcinoma, but also squamous cell carcinoma. So PDL1 testing is part of, of the upfront reflexive testing, if we want to call it that. Um, and the reason for it is, next slide, um, you, you get uh, an opportunity to utilize pembrolizumab, um, which is also uh, category one guidelines. Um, so, you know, the, the, the question of pd one testing by IHC is, is pretty is standard now. And, and a lot of people, you know, this is not a complex test. This is, this is IHC and the use of specific assay platform. But um, it's, its use as a biomarker is still not ideal. And, um, and, and a lot of it is because 
Um, it, it, it's controversial in pr predicting which patient might benefit from therapy, which means that there's a low positive predictive value. Um, other issues with this is that a significant number of patients with PDL1 positive tumor do not respond. Uh, also, PDL1 expression is not necessary for achieving objective responses in some patients. And, and I think this is, if we think about the biology and we go back to what I showed you in terms of the, the simple cartoon, um, you know, PDL1 is a dynamic biomarker. Um, and what we do uh, in, in the clinic is we're measuring it as a one-time snapshot. Um, you know, we take the piece of tumor from wherever it is, whether it's the primary metastases, and then we do a bunch of things to the patient, and then uh, the, we question whether, you know, does this tumor change, or based on the environment that it's located, has it changed? So these are all some questions that are still outstanding. Next slide. So that brings the question of, well, what if we can see PDL1 um, expression in the blood? And, and this has not only been asked for PDL1 testing, this is being done for mutations uh, as well. Uh, this is just one example of a company here, Biocep, which launched their liquid biopsy immuno oncology PDL1 test. Uh, and here most recently in December showed a, uh, a large validation study that shows that this is going to be promising, but the reality is we're still not ready for prime time. There's still no uh, randomized prospective studies that shows that this makes a difference in the care of the patient. Next, next slide. So what are some other biomarkers? And this is a, a probably too complicated of a, of a table, but the big point here is that, you know, we have PD-L1, um, but we also now have mutational burden. And, and the reason I bring up mutational burden is because even in the community setting, we're doing a lot more precision medicine, precision oncology, where we're sequencing tumors. And if you use different, uh, you know, different uh, platforms, for example, foundation medicine, um, you're, you're now getting a mutational uh, burden kind of report, whether it's low, intermediate, or high. And I can tell you truthfully, that I do use the combination of PDL1 expression and the mutational burden when I'm thinking about therapies um, in the second or third line setting. Other things include multiplex immunohistochemistry, really is assessment of the number of protein markers on a tumor and immune cells and their relationship with one another, and then immune gene signatures, uh, assessing tumor gene expression profiles and, and the microenvironment. And there's been some early studies that show positive associations with T cell and flame profiles and those with uh, that expression of interferon gamma. Next slide. So coming back to the genomic immunobiomarkers, because I think I here's where it, this is an area where there's still a lot of excitement and we're trying to figure out how all this comes into play as it pertains to the patient in the clinic. Uh, I, I, I told you that high mutational load and the number of mutations per exome are correlated with improved overall uh, survival. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with neoantigen load uh, in those patients, uh, specifically non-small cell lung cancer, who uh, have a lot of carcinogen-related mutagenesis. They have this high neoantigen burden, and they have DNA re repair pathway mutations. Uh, and some of these repair pathway mutations include uh, something that is used a lot in colon cancer, but DNA mismatch repair gene deficiencies, which are associated with a heavy mutational burden. Those patients should respond well to immunotherapy, but also with our precision medicine now, uh, precision oncology uh, detecting mutations in enzymes involved in DNA replication like POL and POL1. Uh, we have a patient, uh, a lung cancer patient who had PDL1 negative expression through our uh, precision oncology program, uh, was positive for a POL uh, mutation, treated with immunotherapy, and had probably one of the best responses I've ever seen with immunotherapy. Uh, had almost a complete response, which is not very common in our not small cell lung cancer patients. Next slide. So, um, so in closing, I think there's been there's been rapid and, and significant advances as it relates to immunotherapy treatment in, in lung cancer. Um, I think that these improvements in clinical outcomes are coming with emerging re research discoveries. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be taking care of patients with uh, lung cancer. 
uh, and certainly the patients are doing better. Um, now, there's still a lot of challenges ahead of us, and I think um, as a clinician who cares for patients um, on a daily basis, being able to develop an ability to predict who will truly respond. Uh, remember that fewer than 25 to 50 percent of patients have clinical benefit while on an anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 therapy. Um, patients whose disease is PD-L1 negative uh, can still have a clinical benefit as seen by the nivolumab studies. Um, and, and then also, you know, even though liquid biopsies for CTCs or circulating tumor cells are promising, um, there are other soluble factors that are also being validated, but we really need to validate these in a randomized pr prospective clinical trial. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to do it retrospectively, it's good to do case series, but at the end of the day, if, it, if it's going to improve patient care, we need to see it in, in these uh, prospective clinical trials. Next slide. So with that, um, it's, it's probably a good way to end the presentation uh, by quoting Winston Churchill, uh, who's a big hero of mine, uh, who, who basically says it sums it up best, I think, as it relates to PDL1 testing uh, and, and uh, immunotherapy and non small cell lung cancer, which is that uh, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz, for the engaging presentation. We have a couple of questions from our, pay, our audience. Um, the first question is, you have shown a number of checkpoint inhibitors, biomarkers, and development. Which of these do you think is the most promising, and do you think if any of these will become standard within the near future? Yeah, I think the lowest hanging fruit right now is going to be looking at mutational burden. And I think we still need to see it apply to prospective, randomized clinical trials. But the reality is we're already doing this, even though we don't want to admit it. I mean, uh, certainly a lot of patients, a lot of places, including the community, we're getting reports on mutational burden, and we're, and we're using it to a certain extent whether we should pull the trigger on immunotherapy. Now, the reality is now with pembrolizumab, um, being FDA approved in the frontline setting, we're going to have that PDL1 report available to us uh, at the beginning. And, and, and even though the report may say uh, a low uh, expression, uh, I see that's the population we probably want to use uh, other um, complementary studies, like for example, mutational load or something like that, to help us make the decision. Um, we're going to be using all of the information we have available to us. Great. And then the second question is, are additional checkpoint inhibitors being used for the second line metastatic NSCLC following the first line of use of um, Pembro? Yeah, so um, that's a really interesting question. So um, uh, there, there is actually a lot, lots of combination studies uh, that are uh, being in development now uh, uh, looking at that specific question. Um, you know, Getting a, a PD-1 uh, inhibitor, and, that, and then after that, uh, maybe a PD-L1 uh, inhibitor with with uh, another agent uh, uh, is, is certainly in development and being questioned. But uh, as of now, uh, in clinical practice, we're not doing that. We don't have it. You know, outside of a clinical trial, um, I can't really make more of a comment on that. And then another question was: checkpoint inhibitors are distributed discerning greater overall response compared to chemotherapy for the treatment of patients in metastatic NSCLC. What role does chemotherapy have in treating patients with metastatic um, NSCLC? Yeah, so, uh, you know, for, for all the, the excitement and, and to a certain extent glamour in, in immunotherapy now with a lot of commercials and a lot of patients coming in actually asking for immunotherapy up front, um, the reality is uh, the, the majority of these patients will either not respond or uh, they will progress at some point um, uh, on immunotherapy. Uh, this is not curing lung cancer, uh, so the role of chemotherapy is very much still in play. Uh, the role of doing the platinum doublet is still in play. For example, uh, patients uh, that I see uh, who uh, get pembrolizumab up front generally do very well. Um, but uh, when they do recur, they end up going on a platinum uh, doublet. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Ruiz, for the engaging presentation, and thank you to our audience for participating. The webinar and slides will be available on our website at ACCC-ICLEA.org shortly, and all registrants will receive an email with the link. Please also register for our next two webinar installments on February 1st, where Dr. Agawala will present on therapeutic approaches to metastatic melanoma, and February 24th, where he will focus on adjuvant therapy for melanoma and practical considerations for immunotherapy. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your week.